So at this point, allow me now to introduce our uh, distinguished speaker uh, for today. I made some uh, notes. So allow me to um, introduce to you our speaker. So Brother Carlito M. Gaspar, PhD, CSSR, or simply Brother Carl to his uh, colleagues and friends, was born on June 8, 1947 in Davao City. He completed his doctoral degree in Philippine Studies from the University of the Philippines in, back in 2001. He is a postgraduate of Master of Science in Economics from Asian, Asian Social Institute in Manila, 1971, and a graduate of Bachelor of Arts in Sociology from the Ateneo de Davao University in 1967. He is a son of a bus driver who graduated valedictorian of, his, of high, school, high school class 1963 at the Holy Cross College of Vigos, now called as uh, Cor Jesu College, uh, whose batchmates include another son of a bus driver, Jesus Dureza. Sounds familiar, no? First honorable mention and a son of a governor of Davao, Rodrigo Duterte. So Dureza and Duterte became lawyers while Gaspar took up sociology at the Ateneo de Davao College, class 1967, and pursued a master's degree in economics at the Asian Social Institute in 1970. Their paths would cross again under martial law with uh, Brother Gaspar as a political detainee, Dureza as one of his lawyers, and Duterte as a government prosecutor. So Brother Carl was a victim of Marcos dictatorship. He was arrested on September 23, 1972 and placed under house arrest for three months. Then he was arrested and imprisoned overnight in Lake Cebu in South Cotabato in 1974, detained for 22 months at Davao Metro Discom stockade, acquitted by the Regional Trial Court and released in February 1985. It was uh, then when Carl joined the Congregation of the Most Holy Redeemer, the Redemptorist, as a religious brother. As a religious brother, Brother Carl is also a poet, songwriter, a professor, a prolific book writer, especially about the indigenous peoples. Um, he is described most by his colleagues as a man with spirituality that embraces the poor and oppressed. Once asked, why not become a priest? He says, being a brother has always been my first choice. The choice of a brother are much better and wider than becoming a priest. I also wanted a greater sense of freedom and not be confined to doing parish work or maintaining sacramental duties. I could be a professor a non-government organization worker, do grassroots work among the poor, and be a journalist among others, unquote. As a writer, <clears throat> he got so many works, no? I, I, I wasn't able to, to fill up uh, those things here. There's so many. Brother Carl has authored the books, including novels uh, in Cebuano, in English, and contributed a number of articles and essays to various publications. Uh, Brother Carlos has received prestigious award for his remarkable works on spirituality and indigenous cultures, including the Jaime Cardinal Sin Catholic Book Awards for Best Book in Ministry and Best Book in Spirituality in 2015. In 2012, he received the 31st National Book Award in Social Sciences for his book, Manobo Dreams in Ara Arakan, a people struggle to keep their homeland, University of Hawaii Press in 2011. A scholar cum activist's account of Mindanao's history and struggle over the Lumut's ancestral lands, aside from being a columnist for Minda News in Sojourner's Views and Panao Lantao, he has contributed articles and essays on Mindanao to various publications 
in the Philippines and abroad. He was bestowed the Goward Dabawenyo Award by Sunstar Dabao to recognize his true authority on life's purpose and spirituality. With books published, namely A Hundred, uh, a hundred Years of Gratitude, O oh, Susana, The Untold Stories of Marshall in Davao, and Desperately Seeking God's Saving Action, Yolanda Survivors, Hope Beyond Breaking Lamentations, his work now range from history books on Davao and Mindanao to stories of martial law and to climate change adaptation. In recent years, Brother Carl is also a lecturer, resource person, evaluator, a consultant of various educational institutions, church and non-governmental organizations with several awards and citations. Just to cite a few, he received a Lifetime Achievement Award from the Asian Catholic Communicators Incorporated. Uh, back in 2017, uh, as a champion of indigenous people's cultural and resource rights. <clears throat> in the uh, same year, he was also awarded, or his, his contribution were recognized to Filipino theology by the Catholic Theological Society of the Philippines. He was also uh, given the Doctor of Humanities Honoris Causa by the Xavier University Ateneo de Cagayan for this extensive excellent work as an aspiring theologian, interfaith scholar, multi-awarded writer, and a Mindanaoan artist in pursuit of justice, peace, and integrity of creation for his outstanding contributions to develop work and social sciences in the country. Another award is the Gawad de Baweno Award by the Sun Star I mentioned earlier, uh, being a church worker and a respected anthropologist, artist, and peace advocate in Mindanao. Um, another is the prestigious Archbishop uh, Clovis uh, Thibau Award uh, by the Ateneo de Davao University in recognition of its untiring advocacy and achievement for over three decades of justice, peace, and development, especially on behalf of the indigenous peoples, communities, and other marginalized sectors in Mindanao. There are so many. So this is just, uh, th th these are just few. Um, okay, so my friends and colleagues, it is my honor and privilege to present to you uh, in behalf of Brother Carlito uh, Gaspar, PhD. Now, uh, Dr. Paolo will read his work. Um, so Brother Carlo, uh, Carlito Gaspar, PhD of the Congregation of the Most Holy Redeemer. All right, uh, I'm not sure if I'm being heard yes Paul. Uh, you're heard Paul. okay uh, i'm just going to share the uh powerpoint all right uh, can you see the powerpoint yes Paul. All right, I'm not, I'm not going to uh, uh, open my camera anymore because I'm just reading uh, in behalf of uh, Brother Carl. Um, he would like to extend his uh, po apologies because uh, at the moment uh, he's having problems uh, with uh, connecting. Uh, and I don't know if it, the problem is with Zoom or the internet. But uh, hopefully he would be able to uh, join us later in the Q and A. So on behalf of Brother Carl, I'd like to also uh, I'd like to um, express my uh, my apologies. Uh, <clears throat> all right. Um, so the title of Brother Carl's um, paper is "Remembering in Its Challenge to Thinking." The coloniality's contribution to highlighting the importance of memory. Let me start with uh, a quotation here um, but, uh, from Cassandra Clare from the City of Heavenly Fire. We are all the pieces of what we remember. We hold in ourselves the hopes and fears of those who love us. As long as there is love and memory, there is no true loss. 
since time immemorial, our, ancest our ancestors whose origins arose out of Africa and wandered across Asia towards what is now our archipelago, always relied on memory. Through wisdom, uh, through wisdom accumulated through life experiences without benefit of the capacity to read and write or to theorize thoughts and concepts. They managed to survive the vicissitudes of life despite the most difficult circumstances they faced. Discovering the various ways of moving, moving across vast seas where land bridges no longer afforded convenience of travel, they relied on their memory in locating the placement of the stars of heaven that guided them in their perilous journeys. When they began to cultivate the land, the same placements of stars in heaven guided their decisions as to the seasons of land uh, preparation and planting. To show deep respect for their dead with the assurance that they will always be remembered, indigenous peoples conduct elaborate rituals as the dead are buried. Today, cultures such as the Philipp Philippines, so, um, um, like in our celebrations of Ondas or Cal uh, Calag Calag, and in Mexico, Dia de, uh, Dia de los Muertos, are big celebrations. These are big celebrations. Burial markers were given uh, uh, major importance because remembering their dead ancestors was of primordial importance. So when the develop, develop uh, so when developers centuries later would inundate their burial sites for purposes of a dam, a revolt could ensue as to what took in the Cordilleras with the Chico dam, with the Chico dam opposed by Makling Dulag or Makliing Dulag. Needing to find meaning in their existence, they told stories and remembered how the narratives unfolded as their shamans chanted the exploits of their forebears, some of which have survived as epics studied in universities today. One may ask, why such emphasis on remembering? One possible answer is that anthropology could provide, uh, or one possible answer that anthropology could provide is the following. Indigenous cultures place a lot of emphasis on roots and kinship. And these roots can only be deep enough to provide nourishment of their valued kinship if they do not forget the past. If they make sure that remembering was an essential was as a, as a what was an essential aspect of their thoughts, remnants of this manner of thinking has persisted despite the erosion of the role of memory in the postmodern person's perspective, as remembering is linked to memory and the capacity to gain wisdom essential in moving forward. Popular adage and expressions allow us to glimpse uh, into the including. Um, for example, uh, coming from uh, George Santayana's best known maxim, I quote, those who cannot remember the past are condemned to repeat it. And from Jose Rizal, ang hindi marunong lumingon sa kanyang pinanggalingan ay hindi makakarating sa kanyang patutunguhan. This is certainly true in terms of popular culture, whether borrowed from the West or arising out of native aspirations. Thus, in, mu in musicals such as Cats, or in the musical rather, Cats, its signature song is entitled Memory, which ends with this line, let the memory live again. And, and Barbara, uh, in Barbara Streisand's hit, uh, also called Memory, composed by Marvin Frederick Hamlish, uh, Alan and Marilyn Keith Bergman, a and, and also a classic, a classic, classic Tagalog song, Maala Ala Mukaya, and a classic Cebuano song, Buhi sa uh, Kanunay. Songs play, uh, songs, plays, novels, and other forms of art 
have romanticized memory. Many times, the song and the films have the same titles, as in A Fair to Remember, The Memory of You, A Walk to Remember, Forget Me Not, Remember When, Try to Remember That Kind of September, Hard to Forget. Hundreds of novels have the word memory and remembering in their titles, including Marcel Proust's Remembrance of Things Past also known by a more literal translation of its French title, In Search of Lost Time. It cannot be denied. Um, it cannot be denied that parts of our indigenous roots persist in our imagination, which is why in their, uh, which is why there are aspects of this original identity that are break out when we sing. Uh, or celebrate rituals or pass on wisdom, especially those moments when we privilege intuition, imagination, feelings, and dreams. Integral to dreams is the desire to be free, which is why in real life, revolutionaries, especially, especially foot soldiers, for example, the Moro rebel or the Lumat NPA take up arms to avenge the brutalities committed against their families, or they will always remember such injustices. In fiction, many movies deal with vengeance, um, as in movies like John Wick, V for Vendetta, Kill Bill, Unforgiven, Payback, Braveheart, True Grit, Carrie, and Death Wish. These uh, these are realities and case in deep emotions and emotions are strongly interlinked to memory. Um, and as, as Diderot wrote, I quote, we are instruments endowed with feeling and memory. There is only one substance in the universe, in man and in animals. And, and of quote, among believers or of faith of traditions, uh, remembrance is key to worship. For Christians, a key moment both in narrative of in the narrative of Jesus of Jesus's life, which continues to remain present in the lives of those practice, uh, for, in the lives of those who practice their faith today, is that is chronicled in one of the Gospels. And he and he took brave, sorry, and he took bread gave thanks and broke it and gave it to them saying, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. That's from Luke 22. In our everyday lives, what would it, what, what would it be without anniversaries and jubilees? Understanding memory. Memory is very much part of humanity's mythologies. In one Greek myth, we are told in our high school days that the goddess of memory, uh, Nemosine, uh, the daughter of uh, Uran Uranus and Gaia, Gaia slept with, Z with Zeus for nine consecutive nights, thereby begetting the nine muses. How are we to understand memory or remembrance, or one way to deal with memory is to pursue the question, what, it is, what is it to remember? And um, to quote from Lassie or Lacey, uh, I quote, to remember an event, we must have experienced it. And so perhaps remembering it involves remembering the experiencing of it which involves somehow reproducing it. And how could we reproduce it except by an image? This image may be where images are. Uh, this image be where images are important for memory, but the image still need to constitute the memory. The most we can say seems to be that remembering an experience must include having some sort of an image which can be regarded as re regarded as corresponding to it to some degree. Memory also refers to a system 
or systems by which the mind registers, store, registers, stores, and retrieves information for the purpose of optimizing future action. Memory can be divided into short-term and long-term. With long-term memory, further divided into episodic and semantic. To add, remembering is a fundamental cognitive process which is involved in virtually all other important cognitive functions such as reasoning, perception, problem solving, and speech. How do we manage to keep our beliefs which is sold from stories that we hear from friends and other sources about our lives and, and other realities of the world around us apart from whatever we have learned by, by reading books through the years? The answer is through memory or by memory. It is not too hard to understand that memory allows us to retain information. It is harder to understand exactly how memory allows us to retain knowledge and reasons for our beliefs. Learning is largely a matter of acquiring reasons for changing views. We are often perplexed with the complexities of memories. This is not surprising as memory is mysterious, even miraculous. Organic brain matter somehow rearranges itself to encode experiences, facts, and procedures. The most mysterious and miraculous type of memory is prospective memory or remembering to remember. We oftentimes take memory uh, for granted as an everyday reality in our lives. Not until something tragic occurs, especially the onset of Alzheimer's disease or dementia, when a person can no longer remember. It is as if the person has died even as he, he or she is still breathing. A psychiatrist once remembered, or uh, a psychiatrist remembers, I am often asked to uh, assess people with dementia, making me all too aware of the importance of memory to daily life. To live without memory is to live in a, part, in a, in a perpetual present without past and without future, going through the same thoughts, the same questions, the same fears over and over and over again. Without any memory at all, it would be possible to speak, to read, learn, uh, find one's way, make decisions, identity, or use objects, cook, wash, dress, and develop and maintain human relationships. More fundamentally, it would be impossible to know anything and therefore to reason, and, and therefore to reason, reasoning being the process of extracting knowledge out of knowledge. If, memory, if, if, if there's no memory, it would be impossible to build upon anything or in, uh, to build upon anything or engage in any form of sustained goal directed activity. Neither would there, there be art or science, no craft nor court or culture and no meaning either. When we are lonely, feeling disconnected and life has become meaningless, we often resort to nostalgia and sentimentality of the past. This was certainly true for many people during the pandemic. For revisiting the past can lend us uh, much, the much needed uh, context, perspective and direction, reminding and reassuring us that, that our life is not as banal as it might seem, that it is rooted in narrative and that there have been meaningful moments of memories. But if we consider today's decision-making process, process does, does memory prominently figure in such processes in both the economic and political realms of our society? Today, especially in the corridors of power, that is in corporate boardrooms and political institutions like our local and national legislative and executive branches of government, as well as in academic and media 
uh, academic and media institutions, very few of our decisions are based on remembering and, and or tapping into memory. When we gather, uh, when we gather together to think how to solve social and ecological issues, how do we go about discussing the various strategies in, respond, in responding to these? Like the indigenous peoples of yore, do we seek the counsel of the elders who presumably are the ones that have the, the repository of wisdom as much as we raise our eyes to the heavens to seek help from the higher powers? Are these decisions guided as we remember that kinship demands that when decisions are made, these are for the good of all and not just to benefit a few? But look at how our society operates these days in regard to in regard to who are consulted. Of course, those with the power as con constituted by those with capital, either political, economic, social, or symbolic capital. And is the common good main the main criteria, or to further the or to further the accumulation of power? What could be behind this? Could one possible possi could one possible way to explain this is the is to see how memory is factored in our decision making processes. We are a people who seem to have suffered a collective a collective Alzheimer's. For it is often said that Filip Filipinos have such short term memory. Just a few years, just a few years after we ended the Spanish um, colonial regime and established the first democratic republic in Asia, we then succumbed to the lure of another colonial power. Just a few years after World War II, we, hard, we, we hardly remembered atro atrocities and brutalities committed by the soldiers of the Japanese Imperial Army. And just a few years after the end of the Marcos dictatorship, that drove the dictator, his family, and cronies to exile. Then we elect his son to be vice president and then allow his burial at the living and the mga bayani. Just a few years after Edsa, just a, uh, just a, uh, and this happened just a few years after Edsa. And today we are back to an authoritarian government with a license to kill its own citizens. What might have happened that for most of us in this society, including so-called educated, the so-called educated class in society today, or public intellectuals, have lost this capacity to remember? Might our exposure to colonial rule have something to do with this, Con considering that colonial uh, empires always, uh, a colonial empire always aim to fragment people? Because as, as we know, united we stand, divided we fall. Remnants of colonialism, uh, and I'll turn to the next uh, section. Remnants of colonialism and the decoloniality discourse. Until today, we face the remnants of colonialism in our Western oriented system of education and for, and let me read that again. Until today, we face the remnants of colonialism and our Western-oriented system of education unfortunately has perpetuated this. A colonial discourse is then appropriated to help us understand this phenomenon. By dealing with decoloniality, we might be able to shed light on how, how come memory has not figured very well in forms of thinking these days. From an epistemic perspective, um, what is what is the colon what is this decoloniality discourse all about? We are indebted to two Latin American theorists in advancing this discourse, namely Anibal Quijano from Peru and Walter Migdolo from Brazil. They, po they posit that the coloniality arose not just from a greater appreciation of a Western tradition of wisdom making, but also from the knowledge production and reproduction, but also from the East, 
especially Chinese and Hindu philo philosophies, and those arising out of the Latin American and African continents. One can tell through Quijano's, uh, Quijano's explanation of the coloniality's goals. Some of, the, some of the famous names to embodied visions uh, uh, constitutive of decoloniality include Gandhi, Martin Luther, Luther King, Mandela, and Nyerere. Uh, on the other hand, mass com movements that manifested decoloniality's practice include the Zapat uh, Zapatistas of Mexico, indigenous uh, movements for autonomy in various parts of the world, peasant and workers' movements across the third world. Uh, for example, the landless, worker, uh, landless workers' movement in Brazil. In, indigenous and local scholars have helped build upon decolonialist theory by proposing critical indigenous methodologies for, uh, methodologies for research. For example, Andean indigenous thinkers who coined the term uh, vincularidad. These theorists highlight the connection between politics or decoloniality in the production of knowledge, between programmatics and analytics, and thus critique capitalist modernity, liberal democracy, and individualism. This makes decoloniality both political and epistem uh, a political, both a political and, and an epistemic project. We do not really have the time to dwell into these um, into the details of decoloniality, except to lay down some of the general features as to why this uh, theoretical frame might help cement the proposition that indeed remembering and thinking are, are directly intertwined. This is this is of course contrary to some philosophical presupposition presuppositions with a skeptical view of remembering as having epistemic value in philosophy. Migdolo helps us explain this discourse. He says, decoloniality or decolonialism is a school of thought used principally by an emerging Latin American movement, which focuses on untangling the production of knowledge from what they claim is a primarily Eurocentric episteme. It critiques, the per, the per, it critiques the perceived universality of Western knowledge and the superiority of Western culture. The colonial perspectives see this hegemony as the basis of Western knowledge. The decolonial movement include diverse forms of critical theory articulated by uh, pluriversal forms of liberatory thinking that, are, that arise out of distinct uh, situations. In its academic forms, it analyzes class distinctions, ethnic studies, gender studies, and area studies, which have been described as consist consisting of analytic and practical options confronting and delinking from the colonial matrix of power or from matrix of modernity rooted in colonialism. It considers colonialism the underlying logic of the foundation and unfolding of Western civilization from the Renaissance to today. Although this foundational interconnectedness is often downplayed." End of quote. Decoloniality um, is not synonymous with decolonialization, which refers to the, de which refers to the decoloni decolonization of the Americas, as well as the Philippines from the 15th century, which originated from uh, Castile and Portugal or, with, uh, or Castile and Portugal with Christianity as a, as a tool for conquest and colonization of the Americas. Expanding to Asia, uh, 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 and expanding to Asia. This year, of course, we are celebrating the uh, quincentennial beginnings of this uh, uh, of this colonization in our islands. Spaniards and Portuguese were uh, later followed by other Europeans, including the Dutch, the French, the and British, 
and much later the U.S. privileging the discourse linked to a civilizational rhetoric in the sense of persuasive discourses of, of salvation being the West owing to its connect, connection to Christianity as a tool of the colonization. The West then thought of itself as a savior while the rest of the, the world needed salvation. Salvation can be appropriated beyond its religious meaning. Going back 500, 500 years ago, referring to conversation to Christian conversion to Christianity, for today, salvation has several designs, all, all coexisting today. Apart from salvation by conversion to Christianity, it includes salvation by progress and civilization. Salvation by development and modernization, salva salvation by global market democracy, for example, neoliberalism. Thus, the rhetoric of modernity is the constant updating of the rhetoric of salvation, hiding the logic of coloniality. War, destruction, racism, sexism, inequalities, injustice, etc. Today, this is the whole scenario of Western imperial and globalization which have only perpetuated poverty, marginalization, inequality, in, and inequalities. For Quijano, this colonial matrix or colonial, colonia, uh, coloniality of power produced social discrimination, event, eventually variously codif codified as racial, ethnic, anthropological, or national according to specific historic, social, and geographic contexts. It is interesting to note that one of the first international events that began to advance some ideas that later constitute elements of decoloniality arose in Asia. Two simultaneous movements arose out of this colonial matrix of power, namely the building itself as a civili civilizational project and destroying other civilizations. That means silencing, disavowing, racializing in a vast vocabulary from barbarians to primitives, from communists to terrorists. Unfortunately, this involved pro uh, processes of silencing the native population. Missionaries along with other colonizers then got busy to rebuild knowledge they destroyed. Officers of the monarchic state to establish governance following their European models and merchants who built a capitalist economy over the destroyed and silenced economy of communal reciprocity. This silencing is involved, disavowing, disavowing, shattering down, demonizing coexisting ways of knowing, sensing, believing, and living being in the world. What helped legitimize this was the introduction of Christian theology and the transplant of the Renaissance University to the New World. An, accu an acculturation process was then put in place as Christians managed to install by military force institutional settlements, actors in those institutions and, and languages, Spanish and Portuguese grounded in Greek and Latin. Their world sense and worldview or cosmosense and cosmovision over the coexisting ones. We know, of course, that this long historical narrative continues to persist today with the West's assertion of privilege, privileges and superiority. Various terms have arisen to label the coloniality, including a form of, of epistemic disobedience, epistemic delinking, and epistemic uh, reconstruction. As such, various social movements can be covered under this category, which are in search of a new humanity or for social liberation from all power organized as inequality, discrimination, exploitation, and domination. Requiring an epistemic reconstruction, this involves accepting the fact 
that the decolonization during the Cold War, which involved, involved liberation, liberation struggles in the third world only led to the formation of nation states claiming sovereignty, but still constituted by an elite. By the 1990s, it was clear uh, that decolonization was uh, that decolonization has failed in most nations. This can be gleaned from the persistence of patterns of colonial power as it is sustained both internally and vis-a-vis -vis global uh, vis-a-vis -vis global structures. The closing of the Cold War and the opening of a neoliberal opening of neoliberal designs in the 1990s has shifted to today's right-wing nationalisms built on the darker side of neoliberal globalism and so-called progressive states, which advance a 21st century capitalism grounded in a politics and economy of ex ex extractivism that advances the destruction of lands, beings, knowledges, what many understand as Mother Earth. Even as there are differences in the rhetoric and politics of right-wing nationalism, Neoliberal, neoliberalism or neoliberal globalism and progressivisms, all of them reinforce coloniality. A decolonial perspective fosters relationality. This involves the ways that different local histories and embodied conceptions and pra practices of decoloniality, including our own, can enter into conversations and build understandings that both cross geopolitical locations and colonial differences and contests and contests the totalizing claims and political epistemic violence of modernity in the native american appropriation the term used is vincularidad which is the awareness of the integral rela relation and interdependence amongst all living organisms in which humans are only part a part with territory or land in the cosmos. It is a relation and interdependence in search of balance and harmony of life in the planet. More than just resistance, a decolonial political praxis involves re-existence understood as the redefining and re-signifying of life in conditions of dignity. It is the resurgence and insurgence of re-existence today that, that open and engage venues and paths of decolonial uh, conviviality, venues and paths that take us beyond while at the same time undoing the singularity and linearity of the West. The next section, critique of dominance of Western philosophy. Lending its voice to the growing critique of the dominance of Western philosophy, decoloniality's proposition is to advance the undoing of Eurocentrism's totalizing claim and frame, including the Eurocentric legacies incar incarnated in US centrism and perpetrate, uh, perpetuated in the Western geopolitics of knowledge. For there, there is a need to interrupt the idea of dislocated disembodied and disengaged abstraction and to disobey the universal signifier that is the rhetoric of modernity, the logic of coloniality, and the West's, West's global model. Western metaphysics, Western metaphysics notion of space and time are being questioned from many sides today including the one being presented by the decolonial lens, which posits the need for a pluriversal and interversal view. This involves opening up coexisting temporalities kept hostage by the Western idea of time and the belief that there is one single temporality, Western Im imagined fictional temporality. Moreover, it, come, it connects and brings together in relation as both both pluri and interversals, local histories, intersubjectivities, knowledges, narratives, and struggles against the modern colonial order. An aberration arises out of this, uh, out of this 
out of this out of this namely that we are to pretend that the rest of the world has to follow their lead and the us uh, 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 like the lead of the us no because their centrism is considered the more superior how do we distinguish decoloniality from post colonialism and even post modernism we do not have time to deal with this for the moment except to indicate to, except to indicate that post colonialism mainly arose in reaction in reaction to colonialism arising out of mainly the historical narratives of the black peoples in the west in india palestine in, in, in more recent years compared to decolonialities, critique of colonialism, which goes back to the 15th and 16th centuries arising out of the empires of Spain and Portugal. Post-colonialism's discourse arose mainly out of academic pursuits, while decoloniality is from theory and praxis. The academic interfacing grounded in action. Next section, other voices of critique. Up till today, critique of Western philosophy has persisted. Such a critiquing is not tantamount to rejecting Western thought, but neither can we succumb to the blind acceptance which could lead to a full surrender to North Atlantic fictions. Besides, within Western thought, within Western thought itself, uh, there have been there have always been internal critiques, Eurocentric critiques of Eurocentrism, so to speak. Uh, for example, Bartolome de las Casas in the 16th century and Karl Marx in the 19th century are clear examples. I refer to two main philosophers and their critique, namely Baghini and uh, Van Norden. Despite the fact that the origins of Indian, Chinese and ancient Greek philosophy as well as Buddhism can all can all be traced back to a period of roughly 300 years beginning in the 18th century uh, 18th century BC and, the, and, and these early philosophies have shaped the different ways people worship, live and think about the big questions that concern us all. Such philosophical traditions have often been ignored by Western philosophy. Despite the rich philosophical traditions when it comes to dealing with canonical texts, it is the Western philosophy that is privileged and thus studied in the academe. And this is presented as the universal philosophy, the ultimate inquiry into human understanding. If a professor is interested in a comparative philosophy involving various philosophical traditions, this is not considered philosophical studies, but instead fall under anthropology or cultural studies. The fact that there is a, a world of difference between the Western of the North vis-a-vis -vis Eastern of the South mindset. Take, for example, uh, of time. In the West, uh, take, for example, the idea of time. In the West, time is considered as a linear order, in, uh, as, uh, considered linear rather, time is considered linear order into the past present pre uh, past, present, and future, and days are, are organized by the progression of the clock. In, in the short to medium term by calendars and diaries, history by timeless stretching back over millennia. But, but on the other hand, the conceptions of a sense of past, present, and future, but for much of you, human history, this has been underpinned by a more fundamental sense of time as cyclical. The past is also the future. The future is also the past, the beginning, also the end. The dominance of linear time fits in with an eschatological worldview, a consequence of viewing time from a predominantly Christian or Western sense, in which all human history is building up to a final judgment, which posits that when God created the world, he began a story with a beginning, a middle, and an end. Other, other non-Western cultures, for example, the Mayans, the Incans, and Hopis, have a different um, notion, which is 
uh, cyclical. Thus, they believe that the beginning and the end are and have always been the same. The same perspective of time is also shared in Asian societies such as those of India and East Asia, especially in Taoism and even some aspects of Islamic thought. In Chinese thought, wisdom and uh, truth, uh, sorry, uh, wisdom and truth are timeless. To learn does not require moving forward, but to hold on to what already have been learned. Thinking of time cyclically especially made sense in pre-modern societies where there were few innovations across generations and people lived very similar lives to those of, the, of their grandparents, their grand, great-grandparents, and going back many generations. Meaning, meaning could therefore only be found in embracing the cycle of life and death and playing your part in it as best as you could. More important than the distinction between linear or cyclical time is whether time is separated from or intimately connected to place. This is clear in, re in, in regard to how death is de de dealt with. In the West, a dead person is perceived to have expired with the body as locus, and what happens then is irrelevant. But for indigenous peoples, the bodily death only means moving on to another location. There is also the question of the universal versus the particular. Western philosophy tends to highlight what is universal. It, in its pursuit of objectivity, Western philosophy puts no premium on the particular or the specific, specifically located, unlike the indigenous people who hold intimate associations with those immediate interconnected, immediately interconnected with them. There are then very important implications for indigenous communities. In the end, uh, we can only agree with what Bagani posits. He says, the different ways in which philosophical traditions have conceived time turn out to be far from mere metaphysical curiosities. They shape the way we think about both our temporal place in history and our relation to the physical places in which we live. It provides one of the easiest and clearest examples of how borrowing another way of thinking can can bring a fresh perspective, perspective to our world. Sometimes simply by changing the frame, the whole picture can look very different." End of quote. On the other hand, Van Norden posits that Western philosophy is racist, which is also the title of one of his articles. He further claims that mainstream philosophy is narrow-minded, unimaginative, and even xenophobic. Uh, but how else can we explain the fact that rich, rich that, that the rich philosophical tradition of traditions of China, India, Africa, and the indigenous peoples of the Americans are completely ignored by almost all philosoph philosophy departments in Europe and the English-speaking world? Arguing step by step, step by step, Van Norden post posits that. The rich philosophical traditions, traditions of China, India, Africa, and the indigenous peoples of the Americas are completely ignored by almost all philosophical departments in both Europe and the English-speaking world. Western philosophy used to be more open-minded and cosmopolitan, especially including Leibniz, Wolf, uh, and Francois uh, Quesnay, all of whom took Chinese philosophy seriously. Kant, who was Eurocentric, uh, xenophobic, and racist, is the most important figure in Western philosophy since the 18th century. And therefore, his work has had a formative influence on all, philosoph all Western philosophy since then. He was also biased against women and the blind. Heidegger, Derrida, and more, and more were uh, xenophobe and racist. However, he qualifies that it is not his intention to disparage Western philosophy. Not only are Chinese philosophy, Indian philosophy, African philosophy, and indigenous philosophy ignored 
in mainstream contemporary Anglo-American philosophy, but many forms of philosophy that are even deeply influenced by the Greco-Roman tradition are also ignored, in, ignored by most philosophy academic departments, including African-American, Christian, feminist, Islamic, Jewish, Latin American, and LGBTQ philosophies. What is required is what Van Norden refers to as borderlessness in philosophy, which requires a borderless philosophy. Why have Latin America, Africa, and Asia been excluded from the philosophical canon? One explanation is that the confluence of inter, interrelate, uh, one explanation is the confluence, in confluence of interrelated factors. On the one hand, the uh, defenders of the philosophy of Immanuel Kant consciously rewrote the history of philosophy to make it appear that his critical idealism was the culmination toward which all earlier philosophy was groping more or less successfully. On the other hand, European intellectuals held onto the belief of white racial superiority, which asserted that the non-Caucasians did not have the capacity to develop philosophy. A consequence was then their exclusion from the canon. There are, however, some philosophers will, uh, who will gradually state China and India might have their philosophy, but these pale in comparison with those of Europe. Such disparaging comments was critiqued by Said's uh, was critiqued by Said's Orientalism. As post-colonial but also decolonial orientation characterizes African philosophy that have arisen out of the continent's complex history of the field, which makes this philosophy not just an academic discipline. A political charge is at the heart of African philosophy because it arose from a criticism of the dehumanizing tendencies of European culture, which over the past centuries found expressions in slavery, colonial expansionism, and the still very present racial discrimination. Like the critical philosophy of race and post-colonial theory, African philosophy maintains its acute social awareness and readiness for political militancy. At the same time, African philosophy transcends political statements and emancipatory rhetoric, both in its critical approach and its own specific content. In the course of its prolonged struggle for existence, it has subjected the very pillars of European intellectual achievements to a radical and rigorous critique. That's a quotation from Retofa. Constituted largely, uh, to oppose a Eurocentric philosophical tradition in its current form, it is as much European as it is African uh, thought, but often done from an essentialist context. This essentialist thinking remains part of the heritage of African philosophy, and many African and Africanist philosophers have exerted themselves in challenging such clear cut bi binaries. Yet the undeniable asset of this of this history lies in the fact that African philosophy has, in this convoluted search for its own definition and identity, questioned all the hitherto largely unquestioned assumptions of European philosophy, or indeed philosophy as such, both as an intellectual practice and as a scholarly discipline. Among the items that African philosophy uh, would question in asserting in, in its voice include the nature of European philosophy, the idea of philosophy itself as a universal human activity, and the self-image of philosophy as a, as a prejudice-free, ahistorical form of knowledge. While questioning its own origins, it also questions the origins of European philosophy, thus reversing the historical primacy of philosophical discourse. Consequently of, consequently, of locating the origins of philosophical thought in Greece, it shifts this to ancient Egypt, another civilization on the border of the Mediterranean Sea, like the ancient Greece, but root, but like ancient Greece, but rooted on African soil. There are also other elements which are questioned. 
Now, I think this is the last uh, section of the paper, epistemology of memory. We can now look into how Western philosophy theorized on memory, specifically the epistemology of memory. We already indicated that memory has important cognitive functions such as reasoning, perception, problem solving, and speech. Because memory is a central component of the mind, it is not surprising that theorizing about memory is as old as philosophy itself. One can readily assume that memory occupies an important place in philosophy as it plays a central role, not just in the history of philosophy, but also in, philosophy of, in the philosophy of mind, in epistemology, and in ethics. Why endorse the epistemic theory of memory? A main reason is that it fits our ordinary uses of remembers and knows. He for, uh, uh, he's quoting from uh, uh, Frise or Fries. Uh, remembering requires knowing just in case all of the following are true. Remembering requires uh, believing, remembering requires justification, that's justification, and remembering requires non-accidental truth. And we can argue one at a time that remembering does not indeed have these requirements, but a premise is usable in justifying inference only if believed. Remembering requires believing. But many early and mid 20th, uh, 20th century epistemologies were uh, worried about uh, this assumption. Why believe in memory uh, has an important, uh, or maybe belief in memory has an important, or even any epistemic role? Since this uh, uh, question may invite skepticism, call it a skeptical question for simplicity. Satisfactorily answering this sort of skeptical question about memory is a fundamental epistemological problem. If memory has no epistemic role, then we have no reason to believe just about anything we ever learn or think we learn at any time in the past. What is, what is, what is, what is more memory appears to be involved, not just in our retaining what we have learned, but in our very learning. Without memory, uh, without memory, there is no understanding of what is testified. If memory has no epistemic role, then it is hard to see how we could even learn from testimony in the present. Memory seems similarly involved in intuition, reasoning, introspection, and perception. Accordingly, it is hard to see how we could learn from those sources of memory plays no, uh, plays no epistemic role. That most of our knowledge is in memory of, at, at any particular time is a given. What is perhaps surprising, however, is the degree to which even our current conscious knowledge typically depends on memory. The nature of memory was hotly debated in the early modern period by British empiricists uh, David Hume and John Locke, as well as by Bertrand Russell, the Scottish common sense realist Thomas uh, Reid, uh, uh, then critique all of them. Uh, there were, however, antecedents. Traditionally, uh, philosophers have linked memory to a storehouse or a recording device. In the Theotetus, Plato claims that the mind is analogous to a wax tablet. To perceive is to make an impression of, on a tablet, on the tablet, leaving behind an exact image or, or representation what a, of what has been perceived. Memory keeps the, uh, the images and forgetting is a matter of losing them. In the Confessions, Augustine says, uh, perception deposits images of objects into the storehouse of memory, and the process of recalling is the process of retrieving these deposits. Locke and Hume tell much the same story, as do many other philosophers up to the 20th century. Locke wondered about memory and its connection to the self. Locke believed that as continuity of consciousness and memory establish a self over time. Such views were debunked as psychology wide, uh, weighed in 
with uh, new research su suggesting that relation the relationship between memory and the self is even more complicated than that. It was in the field of psychology that also, it was the field of psychology that also challenged the early philosophical theorizing on memory. Uh, during, uh, I quote, uh, uh, during the 20th century, psychologists generally abandoned the storehouse, though still thinking that memory stores information. They believe human memory processing is much more complicated than the mere depositing of items and later withdrawing them. Memory selected, memory selected with stores information, expands part of it, combines it with background information and adds data from the, con from the context in which the subjects later retrieves the information. In other words, memory generally alters significantly what enters it. As a result, rec rec recollecting is not the retrieving, but rather the generating of representations of the past. Recollecting actually generates new beliefs about the past. An aspect of the epistemology of memory would be various cat would be the various categories. However, owing to time and space limitation, this cannot be dealt with here. Psychologists argues uh, psychologists argue that memory and self can can come apart. In schizophrenia and other dementias, someone can have memories but not take them to be their own. On the other hand, Alzheimer's patients without much remaining memory for events can still have a conviction that Alzheimer's is happening to them. Owing to the limitation of time, I cannot anymore go into a deep discussion on the merits of the theorizing of Hume, Locke, and Russell, which fall under the category of representational theory of memory, as well as the critique made by their theories made by the Scottish philosopher, Reed, who instead propose a direct theory of memory. Gaps in Western theorizing of memory, uh, one can certainly conclude that there have been gaps in the Western theorizing of memory, only by interfacing with psychology and, and anthropology that we can gain a much more enlightened philosophical insight into memory. For even Reed, who has made an in-depth study of the epistemic of memory, cannot provide a full-blown analysis of memory. Uh, even he posits to certain characteristics of memory, um, he seems to hold that it is in, in the end unanalyzable and memory is unaccountable, meaning that it cannot be analyzed or reduced to component parts, or at least not, co not over and above its characterization as direct knowledge of the past. There is also the question of the reliability of memory. Epistemologists of all stripes will agree that reliability that the reliability of memory is crucial if there is to be memory no, to be memory knowledge however there is little doubt that within certain parameters there can be evidence of the reliability of memory and, it, and of its reliability in particular situations and among particular groups and memory is unreliable in other ways as well so there's a way out of uh, a way out of this dilemma as to how we can resolve the question as to the role of memory in the thinking process. As I have already proposed, decoloniality discourse might provide an alternative in regard to a knowledge production interlinking memory and thinking. Why is this possible with decoloniality? Oh, here are the reasons because theory and praxis are necessarily interrelated for theory is doing and doing is thinking. This terrain is rooted in the praxis of living and in the idea of theory and as praxis and, 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 and praxis and as theory and in, and in the interdependence uh, and continuous flow of movement of both. Of interest here is how those who leave the colonial difference, think theory, theorize practice and build, create and enact con concrete processes, struggles and practices of resurgent and insurgent action and thought, including in the spheres of knowledge, territory land, state, re uh, state 
re-existences and life itself. And on the other hand, the question is how this praxis interrupts and cracks the modern colonial capitalist heteropatriarchal metrics of uh, matrices of power and advances other ways of being, thinking, knowing, theorizing, analyzing, feeling, acting, and living for us all. Otherwise, that otherwise that is the colonial uh, decolo that that is the decolonial form. An epistemic de reconst uh, reconstitution takes place in many places and in many forms. Decolonial analytics and de and decolonial enactment are two sides of the same movement. The colonial analysis is not a scholarly enterprise, although it may follow scholarly procedures, but disciplines are being used to advance political goals in all the domains of the colonial matrix of power. Uh, knowledge, politics, eco economy, subjectivity, gender, race, and nature. This reversal is a, is a fundamental move to blur the lines separating theory and praxis and scholarship and activism. If philosophy in its broad sense is to mean love of wisdom as it pertains to an activity people undertake when they seek to understand fundamental truths about themselves, the world in which they live and their relationships to the world and to each other, we can no longer be myopic in our view as to the coverage of such wisdom. A decoloniality insists we need as the coloniality insists, we need to recover the roots of our ancestors' wisdom embodied in their memories. Not less than the retrieval of our indigenous roots will be, uh, will be required for us to be able to move towards a full decolonization that uh, argues for a world's emancipation from all kinds of marginalization and disenfranchisement. By doing so, we are not just remembering our wise ancestors and their counsel, but in fact, we heed the call of philosophers ranging from Karl Marx to critical theorists who demand of us to have a sense of historicity and to see the world to be set as the reality of man's coming into being. Man's very destiny as car is carved out of this world and nowhere else. This is because as, as seen as tasks, Man is conscious of his responsibility for the future. Man therefore act, acts, uh, sorry, man therefore act and change his life. One is called to act, to do something in order to reform what is un un unacceptable. But we do better if we go beyond even the most practice-oriented Western philosophical thoughts because our basic presuppositions are so different uh, as we already have discussed. Such presuppositions provide us, deep, as a, pro provide us a deeper appreciation of the role of memory in our thinking processes that would translate into liberating action. This is made clear in view of an accumulated list of brutal experiences that humanity has suffered under oppressive regimes across the centuries. The crimes committed against humanity ranging from the, uh, uh, from, uh, 1912 Tulsa, Tulsa, from the 1912 Tulsa massacre against black slaves in Southern, in the, in Southern states, the US. Thousand Jews burned in the concentration camps of Hitler's Nazi regime. The bombing of Americans, of innocent civilians in Nagasaki, in, in Hiroshima. Uh, 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 the, the Malay uh, massacre in Vietnam uh, by US, U.S. soldiers, uh, the desaparecidos tortured in, and, and killed uh, by the dictators from Chile and Argentina, the Filipinos under the Marcos Martial Law, the families victimized by Duterte's EGK campaign and all the crimes committed against humanity by dictators around the world. All these, uh, all these are remembered memorial, memori memorial sites erected and com uh, compensation sought so that justice, no matter how delayed, uh, 
is rendered the descendants of the victims. The collective mind keeps the memories alive for remembering the events is to reignite resistance as struggles persist until today. To think, to think that this earth still provides hope for humanity is to remember the landmark events of the past and to reimagine perhaps how the lessons learned can be mobilized for today's struggle for full humanity. Uh, let me just read the last uh, part, which is the, a quotation from Mark Lawrence. Memory is all we are, moments and feelings captured in amber, strung on filaments of reason. Take a man's, me take a man's memories and you take all of him. Ship away a memory at a time and you destroy him as surely as you, as you hammered nail after nail through his skull. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, that's the reading of uh, Brother Carl Gaspar, uh, Gaspar's paper. Again, we, um, uh, I would like to personally uh, apologize uh, for, uh, you know, not, not, not getting uh, the, the nuances perhaps uh, as I read the paper uh, or not presenting the nuances as I read the paper. Uh, and uh, I apologize also for the mispronunciations. Okay, I return to uh, Rochi. Thank you again. Thank you very much. Uh, salamat po, <clears throat> Ninong Pao. <laughs> um, okay, so just uh, checking the time. It's uh, 12.08. <clears throat> Um, so once again, thank you, Dr. Pao, for the presentation on behalf of Brother Carl. Um, once again, on behalf of the department and the organizers, our, our sincerest apologies for the technical uh, difficulty we have today. Uh, nonetheless, uh, I just list down some things here. The paper is, uh, my, my, my observation is comprehensive and uh, an in-depth you know, reflection on remembering, focusing on historicity, colonization and ramifications to both East and West's no, theophysical discourse. And lawak, no, and adame. Uh, it's, it even includes geographical philosophy of religion, uh, specifically Christianity. Um, he also talks about intellectual racism, the hegemony on gender, capital, power, throughout history, no, even quoting ancient civilizations. No? that leads to epistemic oppression at the expense of action and recognition of indigenous epistemology and well-being. Yun ang nawala, no? because of this. He also talks about concept of time and even connect it to salvation. <laughs> no? Truly a praxis scholar and a man of mission and spirituality. Yeah, no? So uh, by the way, we would like you to uh, help us improve our future events by clicking the link for evaluation, which will be posted uh, at the chat box. I believe there is also a certificate no? or uh, at a voucher. My voucher, ba? Lazada. No? Uh, no, just, just kidding. No? You will receive afterwards a uh, uh, certificate. Um, and then you may also put questions and comments in the same chat box, and we will try our best to have it sent to Brother Carl's uh, email, and then we'll send the responses as soon as we have it. Okay, so thank you very much for those. But um, let me, if I, if I may, Rochi, just uh, 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 just a suggestion, perhaps maybe we could uh, um, request those who want to uh, ask questions to. Uh, Brother Carl to send us via email their questions. Uh, of course, just identify yourselves. Uh, um, and then we will do our best to, to, uh, to organize something with Brother Carl. Maybe he could still respond to your questions uh, via a recorded session. Um, uh, my, my, I would imagine it as a kind of a question and answer, uh, but uh, recorded. No? And then we'll probably ha have it posted in our Facebook, uh, uh, you know, Facebook page. 
uh, as a kind of addendum to uh, today's uh, presentation. So that's my suggestion. So hopefully, uh, if the organizers are willing to, uh, you know, to assist, uh, then we could still have an engaging discussion with Brother Carl. Thank you. Thank you for that uh, suggestion, Dr. Pao. No? Siguro as early as now, uh, organizers, maybe we can just put there your, uh, we can put our email address where they will be sending those para at least organize. I don't know, perhaps a Google form no? uh, to, to, to gather all those questions so that we can have it uh, sent to Brother Carl, uh, consolidated, and then we'll have that recording suggestion of the uh, 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 but as of now, I, I think it's important if we will have their uh, the questions. Yeah. Or even dun sa, sa comment section, you can all also put there no? uh, uh, your, uh, your message or question comments to, uh, to Brother Carl. Yeah. Anyway, uh, allow me very, very quickly lang po, no? just to recognize uh, the things uh, been written here very quickly lang po, like uh, Lester has uh, mentioned in memory history, forgetting the French philosopher uh, Paul Ricoeur talks about uh, a peace memory. He argues that the happy memory is uh, an option of just remembering and just forgetting because it is impossible to remember everything as well as to forget everything. From this, do you agree that uh, everything, that, that memory is dialectic of remembering and forgetting? Thank you, Brother Gaspar. Uh, Jim Lester, I remember this vividly now because these are your words in your uh, uh, thesis no? when we had your defense. From Mark uh, Stephen of Pandan, Immanuel Kant wrote in uh, his critique, The Pure Reason, that uh, thoughts without content are empty, institutions without concepts are blind. It is therefore just as necessary to make our concepts sensible, that is to add the object to them in intuition, as to make our intuitions intelligible, that is to bring them under concepts. These two powers of capa or capacities cannot exchange their functions." Unquote. What role does memory play in, in the necessary interplay between the senses and the intellect? If a person is forgetful, is it due to a privation of sensate or in intellectual powers? And uh, thank you, uh, Mark. No, we will have that included uh, for sure. And then, um, yeah. So maybe. Uh, and then uh, Jane Gabatino had also put here the habitus shared by a community is far from individual memories, but is maintained whether an individual loses personal memory or not. What can you say about the memory that is communal? Yeah, that's an interesting, good question. And we'll sure uh, have it, we'll have it sent to, to Brother Gaspar. All right.